It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing a friend of mine right here in Phoenix, Arizona for, gosh darn, how, I don't even know how many decades, Amy Clark. She's an accomplished business analyst and management consultant with a portfolio of success spanning more than 30 years. She understands the business of dentistry, the business of business and behaviors that drive the current and projected results. She is an effective communicator, has the ability to create value-based relationships and bridge the gap between today's reality and tomorrow's vision. Amy is best in class as a business entrepreneur and dynamic inter- international keynote speaker she has devoted herself to developing exemplary value-based relationship and i appreciate all the times you came over and helped me at today's dental of course you only had to walk like three blocks to my dental (laughs) office How, how, how many blocks away are you from my dental office right now i'm a couple of miles from there i'm no no but i mean back in the day when you were in awatuki back in the day i was like three blocks yeah, and now and- you uh, you got rich, so you left everyone in <laughs> Phoenix and went to Snotty Scottsdale. So now, uh, so it was, it's an honor that someone from Scottsdale would talk to one of their own trailer <laughs> trash homies from Phoenix, Arizona. But Amy, I, I just got to start with the most obvious question. I mean, I, I don't think you and I ever ever had a conversation that someday we'd be practicing and living through a pandemic, right. and. And they're, um, that's what's on their mind. So there's two things that everybody's talking about. One is here we are in Arizona where you're in, um, you got AT still in Mesa, you got Midwestern, and they just graduated 6,500 dentists two months ago. And they're all like, what the hell? Uh, right. what, what do you say to them? And then, and then in Arizona, the, the cases are uh, booming again. Um, we both know we Arizona governor closes down on St. Patrick's Day and then opened us up on uh, Cinco de Mayo. So it's something to do with a, a shot of Jameson whiskey to a margarita. <laughs> and a lot of dentists are like, okay, these cases are spiking. Do you think the governor is going to um, shut us down again? So, so let's start with that question. Do you, you're here in Arizona. You see the case numbers uh, every single day. Do you think we'll have to shut dentists? We'll have to shut down dental offices again here in Arizona. I think most likely we'll go in that direction um, and go back to urgent care uh, just because of the fear base that's driving the decisions in the market right now. You know, we've got so many practices and patients that have been told for the last four months that dentistry is non-essential, right? Even though we know pathology starts in the mouth, right? But it's the fear of the cross-contamination. So talking about how long I've been in dentistry, you know, I started in the 80s in the Bay Area, no barrier control, hand dip x-rays, you know, so we've been through a sort of pandemic like this. However, had we had the internet back then, I think it would be at the equal fear base that we are right now with COVID because we would have had a global communication. So COVID's the first real experience that the, that the entire world has had at the same time. It's unlike any other time where you could check in and see what's going on in Italy or China or wherever else, right? See how everybody else is reacting. So we're all having not only what's going on in our own communities, our own family and our own state, but we're also seeing everything else that's going on across the board. You know, some governors, still being very conservative and not opening up. I, you know, I'm a supporter of Doug Ducey and I believe 95% of everything, right? I just think that we had too many openings at one time that allowed group gatherings when we weren't quite sure how we were gonna cross contaminate. So I honestly think that we will be cutting back before we reopen here in our state. Um, I've got clients all over the country. My Florida clients um, are having a horrific experience at this moment in time. While ones in Michigan and and Wisconsin are not, California seems to be fine, right? I've got a couple in Louisiana. They seem to be fine. New York, they they have stayed closed except for urgent care, not having the experience that we're having here in town. So one of the things I found really interesting lately is that 22% of all hygienists in our country have opted to not go back into practice. So we have this opportunity of 22% of healthcare within dentistry to be able to provide for our patients. How are we going to recover that? And tying that back into our grads that just graduated here in town, a great opportunity for young dentists to join a practice, existing practice, and not that they always wanna do hygiene, but at least for six months go in and do hygiene. 
take care of the urgent needs of the patients, be able to see the clinical needs of the senior doctor or the new patients that are coming in and being able to help support that practice in a different way than our traditional mindset of what an associate should walk into coming into practice. That's a really long answer to answer your question. I could listen to you all day long. Um, you know, one of the trends on Dental Town is um, we opened up on St. Patrick's Day 99. So it was really hard to close out my day's dental for the only time ever on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, but luckily for me, I'm Irish, so I was drunk both days, don't remember anything. Um, but Dental Town's classified ads for the whole time since 99 had about 1,000 older dentists like me selling their practice with 5,000 ads for the kids. Now, today, right now, it's 2,000 practices for sale with only 1,000 jobs available. So, I mean, so it seems to me, all my older friends, I'll be 58 next month. If they're 60 years old and they've never been divorced, a lot of them are like, chuck it, I'm, I'm just going to I'm just gonna retire. Now, of course, if you get divorced once, you're uh, going to push that out at about a decade. And if you get divorced twice, you'll die at the chair. That's how broke you'll be. But um, what do you say to these kids um, where they got twice as many chances to, there's twice as many practices to buy as there are jobs? And right. when I got out of school, I mean, I don't know if I'm old school or what, but I graduated May 11, and I got my practice open September 21. It took me 133 days. Um, uh, that, that sub sandwich right by my office where the Safeway is, yeah. the, the, sub, the sub shop, that's where my first five-year lease was. And then when that was over, um, I, I bought that pad out in front of it. I was uh, bidding war with uh, Long John Silver's. And, oh, my God, the CEO was so mad. He, they, they were headquartered in Iowa at that time. And he called me up and says, what the hell would a dentist need a commercial lot for? You you, you could go anywhere. You go to medical dental. I need that lot. And I'm like, well, I need that lot. So um, what would you, what would you, um, what would you tell them if there's twice as many offices to buy as there is jobs? Um, do you think what I did walking straight out of school and opening your own office was was that a different time back then, 30 years ago? Um, would you advise that now? I mean, what, what does that look like to you now? Well, it's such a great question. And, you know, with this we could talk about, you know, all day. But what I would say to a young doctor coming out or even somebody that's recently been in co perhaps corporate and looking to buy their own practice for the first time, because it is a buyer's market, using a real estate term, right? The, the young ones have the upper hand of looking at what they want. Look at five metrics within that practice to make sure that practice is solvent enough to be supportive for what that doctor is looking for. So first thing you want to be able to look at is, you know, what is the patient base? You know, the old rule of thumb was look at the charts on the wall. You know, we're both old enough for charts. Look at the charts on the wall. Take 10 charts out, maybe 20. See what kind of treatment plans available. Divide that by 60 percent. That was the value of the practice. Also taking a look at the accounts receivable. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Right. We need to be able to. OK, you, you say, say that one more time, a little slower. Remember, everybody that listens to me is 30 and under every <laughs> email I get. It's a kid. It's Howard right. at Dental Town, the comments. So n no one is listening right now who's over 30. So just say that again, just a little slower for uh, the yeah. dental students. Yeah. So a different way for the dental students to look at it is to go into the practice and have that doctor run the active patient report. So you want to see how many patients have walked through the, the threshold into the practice, sat in a clinical chair over the last 18 months. So you want to see how many of those patients came in. So you want to look at an 18-month window. And then the next report you want to run is how many of those patients are coming back in for recare. So that's called retention. I call it relationship in my language, but it's retention. How many said, I like coming here and I want to come back? So there's going to be a delta between the amount of patients that walked in and those that are in hygiene. You want to base the value of the practice based on the retention level of those patients or how well is the team reinviting patients to come back in. Again, clinical, hygiene, either way, it's okay. So that's the first thing is you want to know how many patients are coming in. So let's use easy math for today. Let's say that we're looking at a practice that has two doctors, you've got a, a senior doctor that's looking for a junior doctor to come in as an associate or to buy it. And let's just say there's 3,000 active patients. Can the skills of this doctor who's coming in meet the same skills as the owner doctor that's selling? Right? So what's their hands? What, what kind of procedures do they like to do? 
where do they want to take that practice? So the other part of the value of the practice, not only is the active patient base, but it's the type of dentistry that was being done in that practice that those patients are used to getting. So think of experience and expectations. So as a patient, what's my expectation of dentistry that I'm going to have if I walk back into today's dental? If Amy Clark, say I'm a dentist, is buying Howard Foran's practice, am I able to do the same type of dentistry that you've provided for your patients? And will that experience stay the same for your patient coming in? Yes or no? It's really interesting, right? Because some of our younger doctors are doing implants right away. They love to do posterior molar endo. Not all, but some love it, right? Who wants to do those thirds extractions? Some love oral surgery. So look for practices that already have the skills of the senior doctor of what you like to do rather than going into an everyday toothpaste paste dentistry, crown and bridge practice, and then try to create a specialty within it if you're just buying it. What Unless do you, you call that a toothpaste practice? Toothpaste practice, yeah. Every day. I, I've never even heard that. What 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 is a toothpaste practice? In fact, I, I I've never even heard of toothpaste before. So this is, <laughs> these are all new to me. What is yeah. toothpaste and what is toothpaste dentistry? Well, toothpaste, you know that answer, silly. But toothpaste dentistry would be your everyday dentistry, where patients come in twice a year for healthy hygiene, perhaps get diagnosed within a their thousand dollar benefit line every two, maybe three years to have clinical work done. But the patients that just come in and have everyday dental work done, perhaps a crown or a bridge once every couple of years. That's what we call toothpaste dentistry. So Man, I never heard that. that I, I, I like that. I, I yeah. really like that. Um, yeah, so, so if but, you're an associate coming in and you want to do implants and the senior doctor has not been doing diagnosing or even referring out implants, that might not be a good match for you. Well, do, do you agree with this? I've heard a, a lot of, um, a lot of, um, where, where's my uh, notes on that? Where uh, um, a lot of my friends that are uh, DSO people that buy practices say that if a uh, it's got to be a bread and butter practice, they, they don't want any specialty practice. They don't want some veneer LVI guy, or they, they want bread and butter practices. And it must do seven root canals a month, or it will fail. You got to know how to do extractions, oral surgeries a must, and then basic crown and bridge fillings and and treating kids. So is right. that is that toothpaste dentistry to you too? Yeah, that would be that would be yeah. everyday dentistry. And, yeah, and 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 if and if and and the bottom line is you're not a real doctor. I mean, if someone comes into you in pain and you can't pull the tooth or do a root canal, I mean, it's kind of like could you imagine if uh, if one of my four boys or your child uh, broke a broke his leg and went to the emergency room? They go, I'm sorry, Amy, we don't do legs. Right. Uh, we we only do broken fingers and broken hands. I mean, I mean, you're a dentist, dude. Get people out of pain. And if you can't associate dentistry with pain, I don't get it. But I can always tell who's going to be successful on their first root canal because you either love blood and guts, you love pulling teeth. Like when I do a root canal, I get all the way to the end and I want to puff a sealer at the apex. And then the, <laughs> and then the other ones are all dainty and they're trying to stay a half millimeter from the apex. They're like, no, no, man, pull the tooth. See, you know, I, I, I'm an apical barbarian. I want sealer out the apex. But you're saying a toothpaste practice is, is that. It's uh, it's basic endo extractions, oral surgery, some basic crown and bridge fillings, and treat kids. Right, absolutely. And 80% of dentistry is that, right? And if you want to specialize into, into something else, fantastic, but you have to be good at the basics. You have to know the core of dentistry in order to be successful, just like you were saying. Right. So these doctors that are wanting to come out and buy an independent practice and not go into a DSO or a corporate environment, they have to be able to do all of that. But they can't come in thinking, you know, I'm going to do a CIRC on everybody and I'm going to do, you know, 18 to 20 veneers and just these great cosmetic cases. They have to be able to get in there every day and just do what needs to be done. Right. So that's, that, so that's one way to find out a value of the practice. What is the senior doctor or the previous doctor? What are they diagnosing? So what are they finding and what are the conditions of the health of their patients? So we know dentists that do what we call patchwork dentistry. We've all seen it, right? So if you're a young person coming in, there are a lot of opportunity, but do you look at that opportunity the first time the patient comes in or do you look at it the second, maybe third time, right? So you've got to find the condition, have the conversation, be in relationship with the patient, not transactional. So there's two types of mindsets when it comes to being the provider of service. 
You're either in relationship and building that relationship and doing what's ideal care or your transaction. I'm going to do whatever I can do today while the patient's in the chair and I don't care if they come back or not. And how you can find that is back to the retention number we were talking about in the beginning. How well is this practice in relationship with their patients and how likely are they going to come back and see the new owner? If it's once, twice, three times at the most, right? So you're looking at an 18 month cycle. That's, That's what- awesome. So I, I can tell you a couple of things I've seen also over 30 years. I, I knew a guy from um, Southern Cal who about the same time I opened a mine, he went out in Palm um, Springs and he found some old dentist that had three chairs and for 40 years in Palm Springs, he was patching everything. So, and he was young. He he claims he fell into it. I I think he was a genius. But this guy did a million gazillion patch with amalgam MODs. And he sat there and basically worked Monday through Thursday and about four people a day, Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, four days a week, one of those big old MOD amalgams would break and they'd come in and he'd just do a crown. Right. I mean, it was the biggest cash cow on earth. And then I've seen disasters right here in our own backyard, and I won't mention any names, where a very famous cosmetic dentist who could present these big treatment plans and routinely did $20,000 treatment plans sold to some young kid out of school because the bank carried the loan. Right. And, and, and he not only could he not do the dentistry, he, could, he couldn't sell the dentistry, and he bought a practice doing $1.8 million for it paid $2 million for it, and it didn't even do 800000 the first year. Right. So, so you don't go in there and buy Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's practice when I can't make a free throw, and where you're really going to do good is if you're a college ball player and you buy a high school practice, you know. So, so I always want to know, what is this referring out? But to get you right, you said five metrics – what is the patient base? Yep. Um, retention. Relate, retention. What kind, of, what kind of relationship are we in? Okay. So, okay. Pa- okay. Patient base, retention. Yep. Then you want to also look at your new versus existing patient flow, right? So we were born in the school of thought that you need 20 new patients every month, new patient, new patient, new patient, new patient. That's great. But for every new patient that's coming in, are they staying in the practice or are they replacing somebody else that is now not coming back into the practice? So how do you measure that? So you want to do the same thing. So advice to the young person looking at a practice or somebody coming in to buy a new practice, you run the 150 report comprehensive exam, last 18 months, run recare, see how many of those patients are in recare, and it tells you what you, how well that practice is retaining those new patients. So it's also the value of that new patient. So are, are you doing coupons and on every single PPO to be on all the lists of benefit plans in order to bring new patients into your practice? Or are you looking for three or five or maybe 10 referral-based patients that are looking for quality, quantity, and relationships, right? So what's the value of the patient coming in over the threshold? Are they bringing you $49 for that special cleaning? Or are they looking for a place to stay for 20 years for dentistry. So the value of a lifetime of an existing patient in a practice, 20 year, everyday dentistry for five years, once every five years they do something beyond the benefit line, maybe two crowns instead of one, whatever it is, maybe they need a root canal or they decide to do a CEREC, who knows, right? Once every five years, they do something beyond that benefit line. And also within that five year, they refer one family or friend. So at the end of 20 years, they've referred four people, they've had something four times beyond the benefit plan, but they've stayed up with their healthy hygiene. The value of that patient is $45,000 for your practice. So what's more valuable to you, that $45,000 patient or the $49 coupon, right? So where's your energy? So how do we treat our existing patients that are maybe 10 years in relationship with this? Are we so excited to them and we love that they're coming in and we thank them for their referrals and We appreciate that they value our time and they show up and they keep their commitments. Or do we give the new patient all the new swag and all the hoopla that may or may not ever come back? So it's a different way to look at the new patients. So that's definitely a metrics to look at. So you want to see what's the existing patient base, how well are we retaining them? And then what type of new patients has this practice been bringing in? I'll give you a case in point. Working with a client that has a very relationship-driven owner doctor, she bought the practice of toothpaste dentistry that we talked about before, and she's been the owner of this practice for three years. 
She has had an associate work with her for the last two years, and he recently just bought in, actually closed the deal in February of this year. She is very relationship-driven, retains her new patients at 70%, and overall her retention of her entire patient base is right at ideal at 90%. Young doctor does all the PPOs, in the flyers in the community, does the coupons, specials on Facebook, come on in, Mr. High Maintenance, right? Double books all the time because he has patients that no show and cancel on him. But his the value of his new patients is substantially lower because he's retaining new patients at 15, that's right, 1-5%, and they're all coupon patients. So which mindset is the better or the different way of looking at growing a practice? Do you want lifelong patients that are in relationship with you and will say yes to the dentistry that you see? Or do you want those $49 that it's just a revolving door all the time? It's a hard work, not only for the doctor, but think of the team, right? Look at the, the front office ladies and gentlemen that have to do all of that paperwork and all of the things that we do for our new patients. So that is definitely a metrics to look at when we're looking at buying a practice. And then we kind of touched on the value of the time. So value of time is your schedule. So how well is this practice scheduling and utilizing the chairs and the providers within the practice? And what, that's time. That's time. It's case mix. It's organization. It's can you, what can you do in four days versus four and a half days? What's your overhead? What's your net in that overhead? Right? So ideally you would want to, when you're looking at your, your week and we'll start at the day, you want to hit your BAM or the, what it costs you to have that, op, that one operatory open with your front. You want to hit your BAM by one o'clock in the afternoon. So between two and five. BAM. Your you got to tell them what BAM stands for. Is that your, bare ass minimum? The, yes, sir. I knew you would. You would fill that in for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! My all the all the terms my dad taught me were like that. Like BAM, bare ass minimum. Then I go to MBA school to learn that it's uh it's your break even point. I, I I went to MBA school, didn't learn anything my dad didn't teach me, but I did learn the G rated terms for uh break even point. <laughs> so, so you can have that conversation with me later. <laughs> So, you know, when you're organizing, you're looking at the value of your time. Again, going back to that case or that practice we were just talking about, the value of this, the owner doctor's time versus the value of the junior time when he double books, has half of his patients no show, cancel on him last minute. He's got a lot of open time. So it waters down his hourly, right? So his BAM, he's meeting that at midnight because he's just not filling his day productively. Does that mean we're doing crowns on every single patient? No. You have plenty of time to see your quality or your higher value cases, 60% of your value and 40% of your time is the math there. So that's a quick takeaway for the people listening, how to figure out what your daily and weekly, monthly goal ideally would be. That's how you figure that out. So depending on how you're looking, what your case mix is and where, where you're comfortable treating dentistry, but it's also equal to where is your treatment coordinator or financial coordinator, whoever's doing the financial arrangements, how comfortable are they talking money? So whoever's collecting money for the practice, it's a great question interview or in your annual interview is to ask that person, what is a lot of money to you? If the person that's collecting money for you says a lot of money to me is $1,000, probably the high case acceptance in that practice is going to be about $1,000 because that's where he or she is comfortable asking for money. If they say it's 10000 or 50000 then you know that your larger cases are going to be easier for that person to have those financial conversations with because to them they're not prejudging what that patient can pay or afford according to their own checkbook they're able to have an unemotional conversation around what needs to be done right they believe in the clinical care of the doctor there should be no question about whether the finances can support it so that would be the next best place to look at so you want to look at your patients how does that look for new and existing Right. What's your retention? How well are we in relationship? Is relationship this? too? Retention yep. too? Okay. So existing patients, retention rate. New patients versus ex versus your existing. So how many new are you getting every month? Right. What's that average? What's the value of your time? How are you organizing your time? And then here's not the key, but it's equal to all the others because these are all five equal points. It's going to be the net value of the practice. So while we love to talk about I produce a million dollars a year 
fantastic. But if you're doing 20% write-offs for courtesies, PPOs, or anything else, or those $59 coupons, you're not a million dollar practice. You're an $800,000 practice. And if your overheads are above 80%, you are not breaking even. So the young doctor buying this practice is not only going to have practice loans, student loans, but there's not going to be enough money for salary. So looking at how that all comes together, and it has to be perfectly like a puzzle or equally yoked, how do all those dynamics work? And as the owner coming in, right, the new owner coming in, how do I know where my best skills are to support this purchase of the practice in those five areas? And most people need some help with that, which is great. That's why there's always consultants out there and, you know, honest broker firms or transition firms that can help look at those numbers for a doctor. I would not do this without great representation. So, um, you know, I, I find I can motivate a dentist. If I say we'll pay off your student loans and pay off your practice debt, I don't really think it motivates him. But if I say you could you could make so much money you can afford a divorce, oh my God, he he's he's all in board. He's like, okay, okay, you got my attention. So yeah. so um, it seems like um uh, I mean, and there's either high volume, low margin, which is you know a PPOs, DSO. I I think all the DSOs are high volume, low margin. I mean. Uh, would you agree? Is there any low volume, high margin? I mean, when I think of Spear, MTS, U, Panky, Ross Nash, Kois, and when I think of all those people, I think of low volume, high margin, you know, building a Cadillac. Right. And then when I think of Medicaid, Medicare, PPOs, I think of low volume. Um, I mean, I mean, high volume, low margin, and and I, I I like them both because I come from Kansas. I come from a long line of uh, 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 trailer trash, and in fact, every time we have a family reunion, the CDC comes in and they do DNA sampling. I, they they don't tell us what they're looking for, uh, but uh, um, so they're two distinct markets, and there's poor people, there's rich people. But it sounds like that like you would be advising that dentistry is an easier business on the low volume, high margin. And, and and what I would say to that is, man, I loved the high volume, low margin when I was little because I had all this energy and, and I was working seven to seven, seven days a week. Right. And, and Jan used to get so mad at me because if they failed the FA and it was for anything extraction, especially wisdom teeth, I'd say, right. well, we don't need anybody. Let's, because I just, I want to pull these teeth. And Janet say, yeah, but how are they tell everyone that in Guadalupe? And they know they they got you figured out. So they're right. coming in here and they know. But it's like, but Jan, but in dental school, I only got to pull one set of wisdom teeth, and and now I'm gonna, <laughs> and, you know, pass up this okay. one. But but as you get older, as you get older, and I'm 58 next month. I mean, God dang, dentistry is a hard job if you're high volume and you're 58. And uh, my God, that just that just beats you up. So, would you say then succinctly that you more consult for the low volume, high margin type practice? I do. And yeah. and that's the deal. Uh, and, and also, I always want to ask because in these times, you know, the, everything's so politically correct. Um, I, you know, as you got a dentist, a hygienist, an assistant, but what do you call the person up front if for, if it's one? I you're, you're you're talking advanced practice. You got treatment coordinators, scheduling coordinators, financial coordinators. But what is just one person up front? I don't want to call it the front desk girl. I want to say you're named after a piece of furniture. I mean, what what, what do you call it when it's just one person? Well, I call them either a patient advocate, a concierge role. I, I personally think that office manager is truly an elevated role. And if there's one person who's doing all of the payroll and all of the accounts payable, she absolutely, or he is absolutely an office manager. And by her, office manager, you mean the embezzler? <laughs> That's it. <a>, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, there, if you only got one person <laughs> getting the mail, making the deposit, if one person's doing everything, she's yeah. your chief embezzler. Yeah, but that's when the owner doctor needs to be accountable and take that money to the bank, him or herself. You do not let the same person open the checks and deposit. That, oh, I know. And yeah, and I always cool. I always post them and I, I just get tired of posting them. I mean, it's like every single month. The, the one yesterday, what what was it? Let me just uh, scroll down. And by the way, a lot of people ask me all the time, why, why do you post stuff that's embarrassing to dentistry? Uh, because I'm not thinking about all the Americans. I'm thinking about the 150,000 dentists, I'm thinking who's going to be the next dentist to make the same stupid mistake 
and he's right. going to do it a week later. So here it is. West Virginia Dental Office Financial Coordinator pleads guilty to bank. I mean, she doesn't even, she didn't, most, I mean, most murderers plead innocent, but West Virginia Dental Officers Financial Coordinator pleads guilty to bank fraud for depositing $120,000 of insurance checks into her own bank account. First of all, how does a dentist miss $120,000 of insurance checks? Right. Yeah, there's no way that that is acceptable. You know, that that's when the checks and balance have to be put into place. And if you're the doctor and you're saying, I'm producing this money, and if you're not checking your dailies at the end of the day and, and your weeklies, shame on you as a doctor, right? But, but come on, but let, let's be honest. If, if you owned a restaurant and someone did that, you, you couldn't pay your bills, you go bankrupt. Only dentistry is so lucrative where one of your employees can steal 120 grand and you don't even know it. And you're not complaining about it. <laughs> so, so would um, so when I look at um, um, healthcare, you know, healthcare was um, it really started, um, I believe, in America with the Mayo Clinic, where all the old men, you know, when eighty year old grandma came in and she had cancer, it's like, well, let's just give her all the medicine was the same. It was it be a bottle and it'd be like a third opium, a third alcohol, a third heroin, maybe some cocaine. I mean, seriously, I'm not making this stuff up. And they just give you something to get you out of pain. Let's right. keep grandma comfortable. And, I mean, come on, she's 85. Let's make her comfortable. She's going to die. And it was the Mayo brothers said, dude, she, her husband's dead. She's willing to sell the farm, the tractor, the everything. She'll, she'll do everything. And then Milton Friedman called the little blue pill. He says, okay, I'll do this to Amy. Amy, you're going to die tonight. Or you buy this little blue pill from me and take it and you won't die. How much will you give me? Yeah, I'm gonna if, if you say how much does my insurance pay, I'm just gonna walk you to the wood chipper. I mean, right. I mean, it, you know, you got one life, and I, and then the Mayo Clinic turned into um, the uh, uh, Sloan Ketter feedering. It turned into scripts. It turned into. It seems like all those people, but when it came to dentistry, it seemed like all the major DSOs went after the high volume, low margin deal, which is fine, but it seems like in dentistry, everybody made a McDonald's, a Wendy's, a Burger King. No one made a Roos Chris. We, you see them in healthcare all the time. Right. You don't have to quiet your dog for Uncle Howie. I, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Lily can bark all day long. It's, uh, you know, it's the day of the barking. I should have given my uh, disclaimer up front. She rarely <laughs> barks, but my yard people just showed up. So there you go. But, but why, why do you think not one of the major DSOs said, let's do the Mayo Clinic model? Or is that just too hard of a DSO to pull it's off? It's too hard for DSO to pull off. I mean, they're talking, they're wanting volume. So that when patients come into the, my understanding, I've never worked in one, so I can only speak of my understanding of 30 plus years in the industry. But their model is bring a patient in for that coupon, $49, sit them in the chair and do as much clinical dentistry today while they're there max out their benefit plan because we don't really care if they come back tomorrow. Now that might have changed, but they're looking for that volume, 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 right? To, because they don't, they're not looking for the longevity of the doctors, right? Because how many doctors can work that model for an existing amount of time? It's, it's more of the churn and burn mentality. We're going to go in, we're going to work really hard for two, maybe three years, pay off our student debt, hopefully not get divorced during that time. Cause then you've got a personal divorce along with your, professional divorce and you're looking for a new place to work. But that whole mindset of just bringing people in and taking what they can is very profitable. To be able to bring a doctor in who can communicate really well, build relationships, do ideal dentistry, make sure patients are coming back for healthy hygiene visits. That's an investment of time and that's a relationship building mentality, which is different than the other, which is transactional. What am I doing today? It's transaction. They're not building the relationship. So when you're in a private practice environment, you have the time and the ability to be able to be relationship minded, to be able to build your practice based on that versus transaction. So as a, a great takeaway for our listeners is, is to say, if you find yourself treatment planning to transaction or having conversations with your patients around transaction, this is what I'm going to do versus this is the fine. This is what I found in the condition of your the health of your mouth. Right. So if I'm a patient, I want to know what my doctor's seeing in there, not just you need a crown. You and I have had a conversation around my poor number three for 10 years. Number three still needs to be done. I know it needs to be done. Of all people, I should be in the chair. But 
if I go to somebody else other than you and they're going to say, Aim, you need a crown on number three, that's transactional. Tell me why. Yes, I have dental knowledge, but I want to know why do I need it, right? And have it's a different conversation. So the Ruth Chris versus the McDonald's, there's an experience and an expectation for both of those. You walk into McDonald's, you have you know what your experience is going to be like. You've been there before. You know what it's all about. You put your order. It's pre-done. Three minutes, you're out the door. Ruth Chris is a totally different experience. So is the doctor buying into a practice? Which experience do you want all day long for yourself? Right? Because it starts with your own personal why. And then what kind of experience are you giving to your patients? Is it going to be McDonald's? Sometimes that's an okay answer. But is that every day? Or do you want Ruth Chris every day with a once in a while at McDonald's? It's up to you what you want. That's what's so brilliant about our industry is you can have it however you want. What was the old slogan of uh, Burger King back in the day? Have it your way? Oh, well, that's, yeah, Burger King, have it your way. So, you can And you know that. why Wendy's went with square patties? Why? Because they don't cut any corners. <laughs> hey, true? um, I went to a five-star restaurant up where you live. It's kind of what my sister lives. I don't know if she's in Cape Creek, Fountain Hills, north there. But anyway, I met my sister up there, and, and it was a, I think it was a four-star restaurant. But it, it was so four-star elite, these little plates with these little things, that I, I had to hit a McDonald's on the way home. I mean, I, I felt like I ate, like, four appetizers. Um, hey, um, um, but we, we mentioned divorce. Um, there's a lot of kids listening to you right now, and they're in school, and they're like, oh, my name's Amy, and I, my best friend, Julie, we're going we're gonna to be partners. And my God, you know, 32 years of this, I, I, I see as I see more divorces between two dentists that own a practice than I even see with their wife. And some of the most famous dentists in the world, Cliff Ruddle and Steve Buchanan were once together, Frank Spear and John Coyes, Bill Dickerson, Larry Rosenthal. I mean, I always tell people that if you're going to marry someone, first make sure you love to have sex with them. Um, and if you're not having great sex with them, please don't marry them and be a partner. Do you, and then other people say, um, no, I think we'll, you know, that it'll be great because he likes root canals and extractions and I like veneers and implants. Just generally speaking, do you, do you think divorce between two dentist partners as, is as big as divorce between in marriage? Do you, do you think it's that big of an issue or do you think it's a non-issue? It's way worse. A divorce yeah, and a pregnancy. Exactly. Way she just worse. said it's way worse. It is because not, you've got team. So let's say you've got a team of eight or 10 and think of your patients. Say you've got 3,000 patients. You've just impacted 3,010 people's lives because you can't get along and you bicker and you fight. There's nothing worse than that. Who wants to walk into that environment? 80%, oh, 80% of communication is nonverbal. So you have two owners that are fighting and nobody's talking and a patient's walking into that, no thank you. You want to take a practice, get some fighting going on, right? So the two things that we can control in the practice is our communication style. How are we talking and how are we listening to each other? That's the first thing. And then our reaction. How are we going to react to what was just said or not said, right? So if you're looking at not getting divorced professionally, you want to and uh, this is for work. This isn't for home. You want to live together for a couple of years, three to five. See how well you work. Make sure that you're talking the same language. You're diagnosing at the same level. You're strategically planning the same way, which just means, am I looking at my future the same as Howard? So, Howard, I'm a homebody. You love to travel, right? So you have to have those conversations. Am I going to be a traveling person or am I going to be a homebody, right? So you've got to think about how that is going to be your life for 30 years. Just like you were saying, do we get along? How do we communicate? How do you language that with your team? And if your team is hearing mom and dad fighting or two dads or two moms or whatever it is in society these days, the two owners of the practice, right? How are they going to say my loyalty is to the practice and the patients first, not my owners? You don't. So you end up with a divided team divided practice. It's just, it's horrible. It's as a team member back in the day, I went through it. I went through a transition, a brokerage deal as a team member. I felt like I got bought and sold just like the furniture. So have that experience as well. So when you're going into talking to teams about bringing in an associate, their first fear is what about me? How's that going to be for me? It's just like a child when your parents start dating, right? How does that look and feel? So you have to be open to all of that. Now, you know, Amy and Julie in school together, we might be best friends and woohoo, it's 
fantastic. But you've got to find out what's your why, what's your driver, why are you doing dentistry? And then what are your personal goals and what is your personal why? Because if those are not in alignment, then there's going to be disharmony, discord, and a divorce. Five right. Years. And just because she used to hold your hair while you threw up in the toilet on Mill Avenue uh, doesn't mean that you're going to like to do the same type of dentistry. I, I've had so many dentists tell me, I mean, I have heard this a hundred times that, you know, when you, when you divorce your spouse and you have kids, you don't, you don't go to the war. You don't want to go to war with the mother of your children. I, I didn't even counter my wife. So when, when she fired me, she sent me the papers and I, I just signed them. And the lady said, well, are, are you going to get an attorney? I go, I'm not going to fight with the mother of my four kids. And that's what most of the dentists all tell me. They go, well, I wasn't going to fight with my ex. She's the mother of my children. But the male dentist, they, I mean, I, okay, so let me tell you how many times this has happened in Phoenix in my own backyard. I sell half my practice to you. I want a partner. So I sell you half of my practice for $500,000. Two years later, uh, we get divorce, $600,000 of legal fees for this $500,000 partner, and then lose, and I have to give her the five hundred dollars back. So I pay, I, so five, you gave me five hundred. dollars It took me $600,000 to learn I have to give you the $500,000 back. Right. And, 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 and what is it over? What was the whole thing over? I wanted to take this PPO and Medicare, and she did not. Uh, what's the other thing? I want to buy a laser and do this, and you want to buy a Ciroc machine and do and it's like, oh, my God, just, I mean, I'm talking. So uh, one more advice on that because I want to follow up because I just really think it's a huge problem. In dental town, it's always coming up. What, what do you say? It's a young dentist. He gets a job, and um, the, uh, the it's either a two-doctor practice and he's the third wheel, or it's a one doctor practice, uh, but the um, the office manager is dysfunctional because it's his wife or whatever. But um, you know, the if, if the doctor says no, they run to the office manager. If right. the you know, so they, there's there's no org chart. The bottom line, the buck. Harry S. Truman. You walked in his office. Harry S. Truman. He had one sign. The buck stops here. And he wasn't going to refer it to a committee. He wasn't right. going to send it back to the hill. I mean, you're the president of the United States. Man up. And answer the question, the buck stops here. So what, what, what advice do you um, give to an office that is that, um, you know, they're, they're getting led two different ways? So if we're talking about patient care, so diagnosing differently and seeing things differently, and maybe senior doctor would have recommended maybe crown, junior doctors coming in and saying we need to do both sides. So now it's three crowns. We'll just say that because it's easy, right? Because that's things that we have seen in our career of different diagnosing, or it's the opposite. Senior doctor wanted to do a crown and junior doctor is kind of nervous about that and does more of a conservative report. So the conversation and the dysfunction is between type of clinical care that we're giving to our patients. My recommendation is that those two doctors once a week sit down for an hour and do what's called case conferencing. Bring up a patient or two. This is who I saw this week. This is how I treatment planned it. What do you see? Or as a senior doctor, you say to the junior associate, Here's a patient that I saw. Tell me how you would treatment plan it. And so you're starting to talk the same language. So again, your team up front or in your assistants can support the clinical diagnosis that you're giving without hesitation because patients, again, are going to read that hesitation, nonverbal communication as a, I don't support the new doctor. That's one scenario. Second scenario happens is that the owner doctor, when they bring in an associate, now wants to do all of the exams, all of the treatment, and poor baby doctor gets very little right? Because they're just waiting to be spoon fed or waiting for their schedule to get full. And the girls up front are giving everything to the owner doctor because that's their loyalty and they're not giving to the younger doctor. Again, you've got to have a team meeting we at least weekly, along with your morning perfect day meeting or huddle, whatever you want to call it, to have those communications to be able to say, we are supporting Amy coming into Howard's practice. And we want to make sure she's getting at least a new patient a day, a new patient a week, whatever it is, and we support the diagnosis that she's doing. Now, if it's the two doctors that are fighting over technology, go to technology class together and learn what learn whether you both like it, love it, hate it, one likes it better than the other, and how are you gonna integrate that into your practice? So it goes back to communication, right? So the more you talk, the more you discuss and you have open dialogue, the buck stops here with the owner, 100%. But the junior doctor coming in has to be able to 
have open communication with the owner doctor, open communication with the team, and the team sees that both doctors are equally yoked or in it together. So there isn't it this running. Equally you, yoked. I've never heard two, toothpaste practice are now oh, equally come on, yoked. Howie. Come on, Howie. Are, are, you, are you turning into a hippie up at North Scottsdale? You're talking about yoked patients. Um, oh, my God. I, I want to... I I want to hold your feet to the fire on some specific questions. Um, they're, they just walked out of school. They're $400,000 of student loans. And every dental journal they pick up says buy a $135,000 CERAC, $135,000 LONAP laser, $135,000 CAD CAM CBCT. I mean, she's sitting there saying, damn, Howie, I make three purchases. I double my student loan debt. What does right. she have to have? She just, if she was going to buy a price, she bought old man uh, Yeller's practice and, you know, he died of old age. What does she, what high dollar thing does she have to buy? What, what high dollar tech is a must and what can you live without? Well, absolutely must is that your computer systems and your technology must be up to code and up to the latest. Your, your DPMS system, your software practice, sensors in every room. And if you're going to do one large purchase, it would be the best comb beam, right? Because you've got to be able to diagnose pathology within the mouth in order to do dentistry. You you work your way up to the laser and you work your way up to your CIRAC as your skills improve. If you buy this technology and you're already overwhelmed with owning a practice and being the boss for probably the first time, Having that other debt that you may or may not have the opportunity in your schedule to do every day consistently is just going to end up being a very expensive doorstop in your office somewhere because you've got to have team that will support that team that can understand it. But it starts with for me, it starts with technology for communication, your patient records. Of course, your sensors in every room. That's not yeah, negotiable. But I'm, I'm going to hold you to the fire. She's sitting there saying, "Come on, uh, brand name." I mean, the biggest complaint I get is brand names. They'll say, "Well, he said Bonnie agent, but he didn't say which one." Praxis Software. There's Henry Shine's got Dentrix. Uh, Patterson's got Eagle Soft. Uh, I used Soft Dent for 30 years and just switched out to um, Open uh, Dental. Yeah. What? 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 If if she had to buy one dental practice manager software system, which one would you recommend? I'm a Patterson girl. I know. I know you're going to say Eagle Soft because <laughs> you, you've, you've been a Patterson for 30 years. Um, and I love Eric Shirley. I just think he's a I, phenomenal I, guy. Uh, I, but uh, I probably love him so much just because one of my biggest idols was uh, Pete Frechette, who who was – he didn't found Patterson, but he took it public. Uh, but yeah. my sister um, – my oldest sisters are Carmelite Nun in Lake Elmo, so I have to do something for four hours and one minute, or it's not a business trip. So my only two options are go hit Patterson or 3M, and that was always been fun. But uh, I love Pete for chef. But so so you, so Eagle Soft's obviously in Effingham, Illinois. It's a monster, big company. It's a huge company, and and you use it. So so you like uh, Patterson's Eagle Soft. I do, and here's why. The difference between, for me, the difference between EagleSoft and Dentrix, looking at it from the user perspective. So if I'm the front desk and I'm looking at it, EagleSoft is more like, thinks like a girl. It's pretty, it's intuitive, it's got the navigation that makes sense in a female brain. Now, this is not, you know, for everybody. This is just how I see it. But Dentrix is more of a guy, right? It's not as bright and shiny. It's very logical. A plus B will give you C every single time. You can't rearrange it because B plus A is not going to give you C. It's going to give you Q. So Dentrix is very logical and very, you know, base. I shouldn't say basic. It just is methodical in its mind. EagleSoft, the blessing and the curse of EagleSoft is that you can customize it in every way. But then that gives you 65 ways to do the same thing instead of doing something A plus B to always give you C. So depending on how you look and how you think would be my suggestion of which one to go to. But those would be the best. I've worked in Open Dental a couple of clients when I was at Spear. I like it. I don't, haven't had the opportunity to use it in practice, so I can't really speak to that as much. I was raised on uh, Eagle, on uh, Soft Dent. It was a C dot prompt when I started back in the 111 million years ago, according to my child. <laughs> so, uh, you know, soft end, I know that one really, really well. So those were always the three major players for me, but you've got to have something that thinks like you as the owner doctor, and then you teach your team. And, and you know, um, 
And and think like a major athlete. Like when anybody says soft end, you know what the first thing I think of when I think of soft end is I installed this soft end and I knew it was hell. They even called it the dental office practice management information system. What what did you just call it? the dental information the system? CMS, yeah, dental practice management system. Dental practice. What, what, what's the initials that you put on that? DPMS, dental practice. DPMS, dental practice management system or software? Software. Okay. Um, the, I knew that this was going to be the, the brains of the company. So when I bought it, I said, well, who's the best trainer? And they said, well, the best trainer in the state, Sandy Wilkinson, she's the best. And I, and then when she called me, she said, when would you like to come out uh, and train your staff? I said, I don't want you to come out and train my staff. I want to hire you. And she told me, she goes, you can't afford me. I blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, what would make you give two weeks notice a day? And she told me the number, and I swallowed hard and said, okay. And it was the best money I spent. Right. I, I mean, because because we I always want to know my numbers. And it's, uh, my gosh, when I look at um, people that go bankrupt all the time, I mean, there's, I mean, there's anywhere between... 20 and 80,000 businesses a year go bankrupt in the United States and half of them are great businesses that run out of cash and the other half uh, don't even don't even know their numbers uh, again if your overhead is a dollar a month and I fix Amy's number three for one dollar but she says Howie I can't pay you for three months well then I need to have three dollars to stay alive until she pays me but they right. they run out of cash. Their account receivables. I mean, I, I mean, Amy, I'm, I mean, so this this is the creep that we continue to see. Labor has creeped up. You know, every time the Earth goes around the sun, you give everybody a dollar raise because everyone knows raises are based on astrology, and it depends on the position of the Earth and the sun. And whenever the Earth goes around and passes Uranus, you give everybody a dollar raise. So these guys are doing what they thought was good: long-term staff, relationship building, everything. Amy's saying, but I gave them a dollar raise every year. And I started at 25, now I'm 65, my, my overhead's 35%. Um, and, and, and since I'm such a nice guy, because I'm relational, um, I tell everybody just to bill me, and now my account receivables are four months. What, what's, what's, um, what, what's like the highest labor and highest account receivables that you've seen in your career? I mean, not like a one-off freak show, but I mean, what, what is the upper 10 percentile in labor? No, we'll do 80-20. What is the upper 20% of overhead uh, and payroll and accounts receivables? So the highest you want to go with your overhead is between 28 to 30 at the max of your total overhead expense. And for labor. For labor. That's not owner's compensation. That's your, you have your own bucket as an owner. But for your team associates, whoever is in there as a W-2 employee to you, no more than 30% max. Ideal would be between 22 and 25%. That's really the goal. And that includes a dentist associate? Absolutely. Damn, Spanky, you're tough. Yes, I am. But your associate gets paid 33% of net collections, right? It's not production. It's net collections. Again, back to all of those coupons, advertising, PPO adjustments. If he's gonna, he or she's going to sign up for all of those, you get 33% or 30% of what you collect of that. So... Great conversation to have. So how do you adjust your team compensation to go from 30 to 25? What's the only way you can make that adjustment? Increase your net value, right? So you organize your day so your net, instead of hitting it at 1 o'clock, you're now hitting it at 11 a.m. Well, how do you do that? You've got to find out how are patients paying you. If you've got me and I'm saying, Howie, I can't pay you for three months, I'm not a high-value patient, even though I'm a crown. I'm going to be a lower value reservation in my schedule for my doctor because I know that Amy's on a payment plan, right? So the re the financial reward or the financial compensation is lower than if I said, I'm going to pay you 100% the first day I see you, I'm going to be a top reservation. So that's one way that you do it. When you measure patient retention, I mean, what I do is I just go down in the basement and count all the people down there. Is that <laughs> Is that how you do it, or do you, do you I broke definitely? Out the, oh, I came out of the basement. Is that how you're saying? And by by the way, um, I'm I've been getting pushed back by dental students because they're they're young and they're green, man. I love their green card because when you go to a dental school, I mean, all you see 
is a little seed with two little green leaves coming out. The, for the first two green leaves, you, know, you don't even know what it is. This you know, corn, no, wheat, Milo, I don't even know what you are. I just see two green leaves. And they say, well, um, I mean, I, I love Groupon. Why, 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 why is a coupon page bad? But again, Groupon, the people that use Groupon, they're just chasing the lowest deal. So they came to you because you were giving away uh, a free margarita, a free appetizer with every drink at the bar. Right. Uh, well, tomorrow you get an, another Groupon, and it's the bar across the street. I, uh, uh, did, did you see? I, I always thought Groupon was a race to the bottom. Do you- it is a race to the bottom, hundred percent. And that goes back to that DSO mindset that we were talking about, our corporate dentistry mindset, right? You want, you're looking for volume versus quality. So Groupon is totally that. And the other question you asked me was about AR. So healthy AR for a new doctor coming into a practice. You want to make sure or you want to check, depending on what software they have again, that your average receivable days, which means how long does it take from production posted to ledger to when you actually collect it, post it, close out that claim, anywhere between 28 and 35 days. Anything more than 35 days. Okay, time time out. My my homies don't even know what AR means. Okay, so your accounts receivable. So Tell them what that means. So it's the money that the patients owe you. So you do dentistry today. How long does it take for Amy and Howard, right? You did that number three for me. And I told you it's going to be three months. That's 90 days. If you agree to me, Amy, I'm willing to wait the 90 days. You can make a third of the payment all the way through. Then we both know in 90 days, my account's going to be at zero. I would be the one off. Most patients, ideally, would pay you, Howard, within 45 days of the day that you do service. That's a healthy accounts receivable or healthy amount coming in. And that number you want is 90% of what you do to be in that bucket. There are going to be the outliers, the Amy Clarks, that are beyond the 45 days from 45 days to 90. That bucket of your AR or your monthly daily production, 10% of that can sit between 45 and 90 days. If you have more than 3%, heaven forbid it's more than five, of your total AR or your total production for your day and your month sitting beyond 90 days, the possibilities of collecting that falls down to less than 20%. So why would you carry an AR and promise and statements for 90 days if you know that 20% of you're only going to receive 20% of that? Okay, so summarize that again. 90% should be 10%. Summarize so 90, the percent. Ninety percent should be between zero and forty-five days. That's healthy, and then ten percent between forty-five and ninety days. Ten percent between forty-six days to ninety days. I I I'm pretty sure I got a C in typing in high school. <laughs> uh, okay. And then and then you said three percent was what? You don't ever want more than three percent falling out into over 90 days, because what's gonna happen is the longer that you're out there, the less likely you're going to recover it. Industry standard says 20% of patients that owe you more than 90 days are actually gonna pay you the full amount that they owe you. And and that's not even what bothers my homies. That that they, I mean, they, they didn't even know the receptionist embezzled 120 grand. I know, they don't even not- know what their accounts are. But you know what really pissed them off? Is humans are just master at, um, cognitive dissonance um so i owe you a thousand dollars and i don't have the money i don't have the money you keep billing me and then you turn me over to collections and then finally i realize i realize well i know why i'm not paying me a thousand dollars that crown she did it's horrible and the bites off and it doesn't fit it doesn't look right i'm gonna file with the arizona state board of dental examiners and every Lawyer I know at the Arizona State Board of Dental Examiner says when someone owes you $1,000, they're going to invent 1,000 reasons of why they shouldn't pay it, and that's going to include suing. Do you believe that or not believe that? or Do you, do you, if th- you, do you, if you, you think let, people that owe you a lot of money are more likely to sue? Well, what I find are the patients that you do, you give the most to or you justify or you yeah, but or you allow variances. So you stay late, you work over, you cater to, those are the patients that usually stick you, right? So if you have a patient that owes you $1,000, so what happened with the financial arrangements? Sometime in that 90 days, there can be a conversation of 
third party financing or can you at least pay $20? Get some skin in the game from the patient that owes you money. Does it have to be the full thousand dollars if they're on hard times and it's during COVID and they're only they're living on unemployment? No, but there needs to be some kind of something given back to Howard for doing that thousand dollar crown. If they're not going to pay you, it's going to be an excuse after an excuse after an excuse because you've allowed them to get away with not paying you and compensating you for the value up front. So they either didn't believe the value, they didn't believe that they needed the treatment, they did not connect back to the why. What was the finding and the condition? What did you see that needed to be done? Relationship versus transactional. You need a crown. It's a thousand dollars. I'll do the crown, but I'm not going to pay you the thousand dollars. It's a transactional relationship. You did the crown. I may or may not pay you. But if you tell me that there was, I had a crack and it could possibly get worse. And this is why it's sensitive to hot and cold and having me be a part of that conversation. I will always make sure that I find at least five or $10 to pay you because I want to honor that commitment to you. So yes, most complaints when I worked at the dental board were financial driven because people wanted to get out of it. It was a transactional relationship. I did this transaction for you. You owe me money back for that. So, so, so I can't believe we went over an hour. I, I could literally <laughs> talk to you 40 days and 40 nights, but what are, what are you most passionate about now? So I love education. I am, you know, I, I'm a behavioral driven consultant in the practice. So I speak to the behaviors and the accountability. So we were talking about the payroll and the increase of the salary just because no, you give an incentive to change a behavior or reward a behavior that you like in your practice. And that's the result that you're going to get. So if you are looking at a monitoring system about that, think about a bathroom scale, right? Have you been following your diet and doing your exercise plan? You should love the number, get a reward. If you're not, you step on the scale, you're going to get a number that you don't love. Same thing with your team in the office. So I love being able to teach education and coach teams and doctors. Um, my sister company, Power Minds, is launching a leadership series program starting September of this year to help doctors this very same topic. What do I need to do not only as a new business owner, but maybe five years, 10 years, even maybe retirement? Does not matter. What are the cornerstones of my practice, what are the four areas of my practice that as a business owner and a leader, I need to be focusing on a daily, weekly, monthly. How do I learn the skills to do that? And then how do I measure it to see if I'm being successful? So that's what I'm really passionate about for this next phase in my career. I'm still keeping consulting very much alive in the business, bringing on a couple of consultants to, to carry that torch. I personally am passionate about the education, giving the tools and educating our doctors to be better leaders, especially in this, these times, right? So if we're brand new out of school and all we know is the pandemic, how can I be a successful leader in this time and into the, our new world? And what does that look like? You can't just go to work, open the door and sit in the chair. That is not being a good leader. That's being a cl maybe perhaps clinically excellent, but are you being a good leader? So let's talk about that and let's educate our doctors around that. So that's my passion for this next phase. Well, you, I, I, I have, I, am, I think of two websites. You've always had Avalon Consulting and Training dot com, yep. and the, then you mentioned the Power Minds Academy. Um, the people listening to you right now should they go to Avalon Consulting and Training dot com, or um, or should they go uh, to Power Minds Academy? They want to register for a symposium. We're doing a full day education workshop on Friday, August the twenty first. I have partnered with Mercer Advisors. I've got their top advisors coming in to teach financial um, retirement, um, how you want to be financially free as a young doctor. How do you get there? Right. It's five dollars, whatever it is, as you can per month. And then I'm also partnering with Dental Intel and EDMS out of Canada for an analytic platform to be able to track the metrics within your practice. And then talking about marketing. How do we market our practice in the new world? It doesn't mean new patients, new patients, new patients. No. But what is your web presence or your business card to the world? What is your business card saying to the world? Does it reflect you? Does it look like you? Does it feel like you? Is it bringing the right kind of patience to you that you want? So that's what we're going to be talking about. So I would love it if our listeners would go to Power Minds Academy and register for the symposium on the 21st of August and join the leadership series that's starting the 1st of September this month. I'm sorry, this year. And we're going to be hosting it. It's not a 
12 month curriculum, 18 month curriculum. It is a curriculum for that will give you several layers to your practice to be able to get you to be that successful leader that you want to be. Uh, and wh- where where does the name Avalon come from in your um in your name Avalon Consulting and Training? I mean, my seriously, my one of my top ten favorite songs of all time was Brian Ferry's uh, when he was with Roxy Music Avalon. I mean, what, 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 did that did that song come from Brian <laughs> Ferry's Avalon, or where where did that name come from for you? Okay, so what where that came from is I believe in finding my clients' passion, their vision, their goal, and creating that journey or that strategic plan. So Avalon was the destination for King Arthur. So for me, it's the focus of the journey and how are we getting there? And it's always a straight line? No. But what does that journey look like? And everybody needs a captain or a navigator to get them from A to B. And I am that person for my clients. I'm the one that gets you from where you are today to where you want to go in the future and and get you there. And so Avalon was the answer for me when I created my company. And and that shows you the difference between a hillbilly from from (laughs) Phoenix who thought it was Roxy music Versus someone from Scottsdale who's talking about King Arthur. And I'm like, King who? Oh, my God. Talk, that, that's the most embarrassing question I've ever asked. I will never ask uh, that question again. So so Avalon Consulting and Training is yep. where you go when you're taking a shower and want to listen to Roxy music. There you and go. And Power Minds Academy is where they register for this event? Yes, sir. And all the education that will be online will be through Power Minds Academy. From Powerline's hand. And, and is this a virtual um, deal? Uh, it an, uh, it it's is. It's going to be virtual? Yep. We've got the clients that are coming in and students that are coming in from 20 countries so far. Um, I've been blessed enough in the last nine months to present to over a million attendees in 42 countries. So I haven't traveled to them all, Howard, but I have virtually visited them. Well, and- you're you're a luckier uh, person than I am because, I mean, like, um, I, you know, when I when I started lecturing, I mean, think how tough it was. I mean, yeah, so when I, uh, August fourth, nineteen ninety, next month will be my thirty year anniversary of my first lecture, and it was in New York. And so I um I didn't I didn't even think about you know I didn't prepare slides or anything. I was just gonna go and rant, but it wasn't until a couple <laughs> days before that I realized ah, I'm kind of nervous. So I called my best friend from dental school, uh, Craig Sykin over Albuquerque. And I asked him, what he goes, Oh man, I'm flying to Phoenix with you. We'll go together. It was so damn fun. But you know, it was a five hour flight to New York city. And, and I, I, I chose New York city because growing up in Kansas, uh, I, I just wanted to see New York city. I'd never been to New York city before. Uh, but it was a five hour flight there and a five hour flight back. And then when I first got invited to speak to, um, India, I was so excited, but I didn't realize Five hours in New York, layover, 15 hours, New Delhi, reverse track. The worst one I ever gave in my life, uh, luckily three of my four boys went with me. It was 36 hours from leaving the house in Ahwatukee to checking into our hotel room. It was in Cambodia, and we had to fly to San Francisco, um, Tokyo, Japan, Hong Kong, and then to... uh, um, Kuala Mandu, Malaysia, and then the Canva. But 36 hours later, you're actually hoping that a dump truck runs over you <laughs> and then a cement truck, you know, hits you just to make sure there's nothing left. And now to be sitting here without your shoes and socks on and you're lecturing to people in Cambodia and India and all around the world, is it's it just it's it's a beautiful thing. And you're a beautiful thing. And I'm so glad that you came on the show. To talk to these kids because um, um, I, you know, the whole value, knowledge has no value if it's not transferable. And I don't even talk about what's transferable while we're alive. I mean, I mean, when I was born in 62, that, that was a nice campground that 120 billion dead humans made over the last 1 million years. Mitochondrial Eve, which was romantically named after... Adam and Eve, I mean, every species has the last common ancestors. And ours was a million years ago on the eastern ridge of Africa. And a million years later, here we are. And um, I just, um, I'm at the retirement end. And so I only care about our replacements. I'm only worried about the class of 2020. I mean, I, I mean, if you're going to sit around and worry about what a bunch of 60-year-old dentists uh, are going to do, I mean that, that I I'm worried about what a bunch of 25 year old babies are going to do, and they're um, and I think it's going to be good for them because, you know, when I was little, the only people that saved money were the grandparents who grew up during the depression. 
Right. Uh, and my, my grandparents grew up in the Depression. My parents gave me depression, uh, you know, but uh, um, I mean, I walked out of um, high school in 1980. That was the worst economic collapse I've seen. I, I haven't seen anything like this. It's like when you talk to a Vietnam vet, they're not, they're not worried about home quarantine. They, they you know, they right. lived in a jungle for a year getting shot at. Um, but, the, but when I walked out there at 80 and I saw interest rates 21%, I'll never look at debt the same way again because a lot of people thought they had debt on a John Deere tractor for their wheat farm at 8% and three months later it was 21%. They didn't they didn't know the difference between fixed interest rates and floating interest rates. And th these kids don't realize that when a banker says, oh yeah, the interest will be 200 basis points floating over prime. Ha <laughs> ha, floating over prime? F did you say floating over prime? <laughs> I had three friends of mine whose dad walked into the barn and blew his head off because he lost the family farm that had been in generations for years and years and years. I mean, you just don't walk out of school and go buy 100 acres and start a dairy farm. You got to inherit that dairy farm. And um, and then I graduated in 87. I graduated May 11, 87. And October 11th was Black Monday where the stock market fell. So they were all good shocks for me. So when, and, and who were the unluckiest dentists in the world the ones that graduated in 94 when that stock market from 94 to the year 2000 i mean i mean a monkey could pick stocks and every one of them would double and everybody just thought money fell from trees and then when that stock market crashed you could see how clueless they were and I, I remember in the 2008 thing, it's the same thing. It's always the same people that live beyond their means, have way too much debt, don't know their numbers, and then their 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 normal changes. And now they got a new normal, and they're like, oh, I wasn't prepared for this. I'm like, and, and you know the red flags. I, I can show you here in my own backyard where the young dentist that graduated from dental school already has a bigger house than his mom and dad, and his dad's a dentist. It's like, are, are you out of your mind? You're 28 years old. You, you, bar you can barely find your butt cheeks with each hand. You know, they'd give them two hands, they'd find one butt cheek. And I'm like, you have a bigger house than your dad? Are you like a rock star? Are you a rapper? Did, did I miss something? So just, just, my God, live below your means. Cash yeah. is king. If you need a new car and a big house and a Gucci purse and a Porsche, uh, you probably just need some self-esteem. And I promise you, I love you. You, you know, you're you're validated. You don't you don't need a Mercedes Benz. Howie loves you. I just I just need you to love yourself. And it's not loving yourself because what you don't realize when you're born. Easy math. 100 years. You're born. You live 100 years. When you go buy that $500,000 house. How much do you make an hour? You just gave them a big chunk of your life. So you told me that you just gave him ten percent of your life for this house. Well, how can I cut off your arm and I'll give you my Lexus? I mean, will you trade your your eye? I love doing that with the grandkids. It's so funny. I always say, well, which would you rather do if you had to pick between losing your eyes and you couldn't see, or losing your ears and couldn't hear? And my three year old just keeps saying. Well, I don't want to lose any of them. She's, she's, she's not going to make a decision. She's like, no, I'm not losing them. But so just live below your means. Yep. Listen to your elders. We're not doing this for free. I mean, for a, I mean, there's a reason we're doing this for free. It's like um, we're trying to transfer three decades of knowledge in dentistry to some baby who just walked out of dental grammar school. Right. And uh, so listen to your elders, be humble, live below your means. And my God, your mom and dad would love it if you moved back home and moved in with them. You don't, if you got $400,000 of student loans, why the hell are you buying a house? Right. And why are you buying a new car? Right. Um, you know, so um, Amy, thank you so much for all that you've done for me personally. And thank you so much today for coming on the show. Thank you, Howard, for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Have a great day. Right. Okay. You too.